One question. I'll share with you a story from Best Buy. Best Buy in 2012, sunny days at Best Buy. Things were going really well. Stock was doing really well. Until almost overnight, you could see this like metaphorical cloud rolling over the horizon, right over Best Buy's office. This metaphorical cloud was pretty much Amazon and Walmart. They were really diving into this electronics e-commerce side of things. And all of a sudden, almost overnight, they were beating Best Buy in price, they were beating Best Buy in selection, and they were certainly beating Best Buy in convenience. Now you've got Amazon Prime, a TV that's going to show up in your lobby or at your front door in ways that Best Buy just couldn't compete with. Best Buy stock started tumbling. 60% it was down in 2012, and they brought in a new CEO. His name was Hubert Jolly. And it was Hubert's goal not to figure out what was just going wrong with the company, but he wanted to figure out what was going right. What could we double down on? So he started to look at the performance of all the Best Buys from all across the country, all across the United States, and he noticed there was one Best Buy just outside of Boston that was performing double digits better than the rest. Now here's what we need to know about Best Buy. Best Buy is a lot like a convenience store, right? They're all pretty much laid out exactly the same so that there is that familiarity when you walk in. So what could they have been doing just outside of Boston that allowed, that permitted for a double digit increase or improvement over every other store in the country? He wanted to figure it out. So he went over just outside of Boston. He did the whole like undercover CEO thing, right? The hat and the glasses and the fake mustache. And he walked into the store expecting like Costco samples or streamers and confetti or, you know, some slash sales or something like that. And he noticed that there was nothing different in this Best Buy. Everything looked like all of the other stores that he'd been to before. And so he wanted to figure out then why was it that the, that the associates had slightly bigger smiles on their faces and were just slightly more inclined to be a little bit more helpful than he was used to. So he went up and talked to one of the associates. He said, excuse me, can I, can I have a quick conversation with you? And she said, sure. He said, hey, can, can you tell me, do, do, you love, do you love your job? Do you love working here? And she said, yeah, actually I do. I really love working here. It's the best job I've ever had. He said, that's amazing. Well, can I ask you a second question? What do you love about working here? I'm going to take a quick time out on the story for a second. So just hold that there and tell you that I've asked this question about 5,000 times. What do you love about working here? And I got to tell you, when people love where they work, <laughs> the response that I get is always the same, and it's always two words. When I ask the question, what do you love about working here, why don't you tell me what they say back? That's right, in unison, the people. So sure enough, on time, we're back in the story. He said, what do you love about working here? She says, the people. He said, that's amazing. What is it about the people here that allow you to love your job so much? He said, well, I feel like if I have an idea, somebody's listening. If I, have, I feel like I'm having a bad day, others are going to lift me up. If I feel like I'm having a great day, I can lift others up. I feel like I can just be fully me here, and I love that. He said, amazing. So what is it that you're actually doing here? What's the habit? What's the routine? What's the behavior that you're doing here that allows you to feel that way? You know what she said? She said, I don't know. Which, which tells me that whatever they had been doing over and over and over again was so routine, was so habitual, that it didn't even stand out anymore. So Hubert thanked her for her time, left the store, and thought, I better figure out what's going on at this Best Buy here. So the next morning, he comes in at 9.30 before the gate opens. Now he's taking his hat and his glasses and his mustache off, and he wants to figure out what's happening at this Best Buy. And so he sees that everyone's in a huddle in the back of the store. And he goes to the back of the store, and he, what the hell? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we got a squirrel in attendance this morning up in the front row. That is something I have never seen before, and we're going to remember that one forever. All right. Where were we? <laughs> Gosh, talk about a show stealer, hey? Hey, Bill, you looking for your 10,000 steps today or what? We got a squirrel up on stage left. Anyways, <laughs> here he goes. Yeah, it's, uh, it's up by the water on the, on the... Okay, let's go right back. He... <laughs> Let's just make sure, let's just make sure we've got everyone back. Huber goes into the back of the store, he sees a huddle in the back, in the back of the store. And, uh, and he, what he discovers is that the supervisors, whoever was on shift that day, turns out that the supervisors, he or she or they, would ask their, their associates one simple question every single day, and whoever was an associate on shift that day would have 15 to 30 seconds to respond to that question. 
Now, they could respond with the same answer they've always said, or they could bring a brand new response every day that they were working. It didn't matter. But the question, I'm hoping you remember this, was this. What is your dream, and how are we at Best Buy here to help you make that dream come true? And one by one, every one of the associates would respond to that question. One person said, I'm saving for my kid's college fund. Another person said, well, I've actually never been to college. I can't wait. I'm going to be the first one in my family. I'm going next September. You're helping me make that dream come true. Another person said that when I was 15 years old, I wanted to go to Disneyland more than anything in the world. And my family, well, we just couldn't afford it. And it was that day where I put my stake and I put my flag in the ground and I said, one day I'm going to be that mother that takes her kids to Disneyland. So since that time, she'd been saving pennies in the piggy bank, a little bit of deposits in the, in, the, in the bank. And finally, in February of that next year, she was going to take her husband and her two kids to Disneyland, making a, a lifelong dream come true. And what they found is that when they started to understand what folks were working towards outside of work, people at work were more inclined to help them make those dreams come true. They would hand over clients that might be a better fit to the problems that they could solve. And by sharing this little bit of understanding as to what people were working towards, what their goals were, all of a sudden this team came together and was more effective than any other store that Best Buy was operating. In fact, Hubert started to put that policy into all the Best Buys across the country and into the United States. And what he found is that when he put this practice in, people started to be more collaborative. They started to care a little bit more about each other. And over the next six years, the stock price jumped about 800%. Now, can we attribute it down to one question? No, but it is starting with a foundation of trust that is most important. Here's what we know, is that those that trusted each other in an ADP Research Institute study just this year, we're 15 times as likely to be engaged. Wow. Now, i got a bit of a problem with this, actually. <laughs> I think it's the problem is the word engaged. We've been talking about engagement for 20, for 30 years. How do we get our people engaged as if it's something that we do? Engagement's not what we fix. Engagement's what happens when we give attention to what needs to be fixed. Engagement is an outcome. Trust, psychological safety, belonging, respect, integrity, those are all inputs. Time, attention, all very important. How are we doing, Bill? This is something else. Engagement's not what we fix, it's what, we hap it was what, we, what happens when we fix what really needs attention, because here's what we know to be true. Can we just hear it for that squirrel? It's backstage now. The world is moving faster than it ever has before, okay? Every minute of the day, take a look at some of these numbers. 167 million videos watched on TikTok. What? How is that even possible? Forget the numbers for a second. Just take a look at the logos. How many of these logos were around 15 years ago? Yelp? No. <laughs> YouTube? No. Netflix? No. TikTok? No. Snapchat? I mean, I mean, text maybe, but you had to press five three times for the letter N, right? It was a slightly different experience. All this to be said, the world is changing so fast around us that Pew Research says that we're living 31 and a half hour days right now. What? How is that, how is that possible? We only have 24 hours in the day. Of those 17 hours, we're, you know, awake. Where do those extra seven and a half hours come from? <laughs> Turns out that they come from multitasking. And I think that we can agree that we're trying to do, to do two things at once. We're not doing anything all that well. And the sad part is we're probably doing two things at once for upwards of 42% of our day. Just incredible. What I've learned through Hubert Jolly, what I've learned through Kevin Stefanski, what I've learned through all the work that we've done is that indeed the fastest way to speed up human connection is to slow down. Imperative, important, and something that we can all take away. Because even in Top Gun, quick show of hands, who saw Top Gun? I'm going to assume most people saw Top Gun. Top Gun, right, movie of 2022. When time was tight, when resources are limited, when the team just wasn't getting it. They are in the classroom, they weren't meeting their times, they weren't meeting their goals, they weren't collaborating to the level that they should have. What did Tom Cruise, with the weight of the world on his shoulder, what did he do to get them to collaborate and come together again? Yeah, that's right. Well, off to the beach we go, right? Beach football. He knew that the fastest way to speed up human connection was indeed to slow down. And am I leaving this slide up a little bit longer than I probably should? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely I am. All that to be said, I think we should move from checking on our teams to checking in with our teams, right? When I think of checking on, I think of like an org structure. I think hierarchy. I think like top down, looking down, checking on something. Like checking on dinner, right? You don't ask dinner how it's doing. You just check on it. I think we should shift from checking on to checking in, where instead of top down, we're now like eye to eye, heart to heart. 
asking the most simple, the most basic, the most human-centric questions. Like, how are you? What did you learn this week? What can we improve on? What mistakes did you make? My favorite question, this one's for free. What are you most excited about? Such an easy question that allows us to get a little bit of a deeper understanding to figure out what people are interested in. Another bonus, this one doesn't even require necessarily a transaction, doesn't even require feedback. Quick two words, thank you. In a world that's moving faster than it ever has before, sometimes the fastest way to speed up human connection is to slow down.